I got to this one because that's really the whole essence of what the sermon is, is get to Jesus. And so I want to look at coming to Jesus and his response about when we come. And we're going to look at about four different episodes or examples in the Bible that someone came across, how they came, what was the scenario, when they came, how were they received by Jesus. Uh, and so we're going to look at, my hope is that you'll understand the importance of coming to Jesus regardless of the obstacles that's in your way. No matter how unworthy you feel, no matter how bad maybe that you've been this week. No, no difference what other people say that you have no business going to Jesus. You know, he didn't care about you or you're a phony or whatever it is. It's my hope is that you'll understand that Jesus is going to welcome you, that he desires to have that interaction, and that as you come to him, he'll come to you as well. The first example we're going to look at is the story of Nicodemus. And we're not going to look at the context of the conversation that he had with Jesus. I will tell you it's in John chapter 3. And it is the John 3, 3 where Jesus told Nicodemus, a man must be born again to inherit the kingdom of heaven. But I want to look just at the coming of Jesus. Because Nicodemus is a religious leader. He is a Pharisee. You know, the Pharisees was this group that were looking to trap Jesus. They were looking to catch his words and, and trap him in what he said that they might be able to punish him. But Nicodemus is different than the rest of them. He, he, he knew that there was something special about Jesus. And so he sought out Jesus to talk with him. So look at John chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2. It says, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And we're looking at the second verse. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Nicodemus, he came in the cover of darkness to seek out Jesus. He, he came at a time that no one else should be able to see him come. Uh, he knew that the Pharisees, that he was a part of, he knew they wouldn't like it. And so he came in secrecy to find Jesus. He was willing to risk it. Be, he may not be brave where he went out in the public eye and, and went before the master, but he knew the importance of getting to Jesus for the answers. And so he was willing to, to risk this. It was worth it. Did he come in secret because of pride? I don't think it was because of pride. It doesn't really say. I, I would imagine it is because of the turmoil, the ridicule, the, the, what would happen if the Pharisees knew. But regardless of the reason why he came at dark, the important thing is that he came. And that's the thing you've got to realize. Regardless of the reason sometimes why you come, you may come strictly out of guilt. You may come because you, you have just felt God. You, for whatever the reason, it doesn't really matter. As much as the point, what matters is that you come. We need to come before Jesus. And, and, and that's what we're, we're looking at here. That's what Nicodemus needs. Pride, pride should never keep you from coming to the Lord. The opinions of others. Listen, and, and you say it that way, well, that don't matter to me. It does. There's, there's times during prayer that you would like to get up and go and kneel. But you're shy, you're embarrassed, nobody else is but the pastors or whatever it is. Listen, the opinions of others should not carry that much weight that it would keep us from having an encounter with God. But oftentimes it does. And that was the case with Nicodemus. It's not just pride, but pride's not totally new. So we go from Nicodemus and we go to the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, y'all know who he is, right? Everybody wants to say he was a wee little man. A wee, a wee little, little man, man was he. he. You know, you can say, I didn't want to say that. I bet you do now, though. Zacchaeus was a rich and powerful man in Jericho. He was the chief tax collector. He was hated, not because of what the IRS is hated here. He was hated because he was one of them, and he was in charge of collecting the taxes for the Roman Empire. And he got his share and his, his money off of there. And then he sent the rest uh, you know, to the Roman Empire. He made his wealth off of the money of those around him. And they had no choice but to pay him what he asked for. So we're going to look at the story of Zacchaeus uh, in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. So Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had became very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. 
When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and he took Jesus to his home in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord. If I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. What you're seeing is repentance here. He is <coughs> repenting. He's turning from his ways. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Now, Zacchaeus was not a well-liked individual in Jericho. He was short, yes. He couldn't see over the crowns. I don't know how short he was, but he was evidently pretty short. But he was determined that he was going to see Jesus. He was going to have his encounter, at least visibly, and be able to see Jesus. So he knew the path he was going. He ran ahead. He climbed a sycamore fig tree. He got up on those limbs where he could look over the heads of everybody and at least get a glimpse as he went by. Zacchaeus did not let his stature, his shortness, keep him from seeing Jesus. He did not let that obstacle get in the way. He could have said, man, I can't see over the crowd. What a drag. I wish I'd have got out here earlier and went home. He didn't do that. See, we cannot let the things, things of life, we can't let things hinder us from getting into the presence of the Lord. Now, I don't think Zacchaeus thought he was going to have an audience with Jesus. I think he's just heard about this great teacher. He wanted to see him and he, he was going to see what he looked like and who he was and he was determined to do that. I don't believe though that he thought he was going to have any kind of real vocal encounter or anything like that. He certainly, I don't think, thought that Jesus wanted to see him, that Jesus would want to you know, speak with him and have any kind of relationship with him. See, because that his, he knew who he was. He, he no doubt knew the wrongs that he had done. He knew the, sin, the sin, sinfulness of his life. He knew the things that people despised about him. And I think whenever he climbed that tree and Jesus passed by, and Jesus looked up and called out to him by name and said, I want you to climb down on that tree because I've got to be in your house today. I think it floored him. It took him by surprise. And he, he climbed down that tree as quick as he could to get there. But listen, the people around, the mob that was following all those people that Zacchaeus couldn't see over, they didn't like that Jesus was going to go to the home of a notorious sinner. But guess what? Jesus didn't care what they thought. I, I love this. about I, I just love when you read in the Bible and you read the encounters and the stories of Jesus and relationships and and stuff, you when you see what people go through and, and, and their determination to get before them. And, and you know, there was never anyone who ever did anything to find a way to cry out, to call out, to reach through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment that was turned away, that was rejected by Jesus. Now, the people didn't like it, but Jesus didn't care. I want to tell you something. People may think that you have no business crying out to God. They might think, listen, and it's probably with people that are closer to you. It could be husband and wives and moms and dads or kids and stuff. And, and you want to raise your hand during worship, but you think they don't think you have any business doing that because they know who you are and they know the choices you make. It may be that, that, that you don't feel like you should come down to the front and pray or you should worship or you should do whatever because you don't think you're worthy of it. You don't, you don't think it's right. Maybe you feel like you have let God down too many times, that he has no interest in you. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I, I think sometimes you really have a heart's desire to live a certain way for God that is genuine and sincere, and yet you don't act upon it for a while. You want to, you sincerely want to, but there's something about your flesh that just hinders you from... Can, can I tell you, I have told Vita in the last three, four weeks... That I am going to the gym. Now, now listen to me. I'm, and I tell her, but listen, I, it is a sincere plan that I have and a sincere desire. And when I tell her that, she, she gets tired of hearing it. And so like somebody who said, talks about, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. I'm going to start doing better. And other people just kind of smirk at you the way she does me. 
and, and you, you, you know, you think, I don't even want to tell them anymore. And so you get to the point you don't want to say it anymore because you know they don't believe you. And, but you know inside, you really, listen, I really do. I do. I do this muscle, and then I do this one, and there's not one even there, you know? Uh, what happened to that, you know? And, and so I really do, and then I watch the videos as I'm editing them, and, and I'm like, my gosh, look at your body. You know, you should be better. And so when I say that, I'm, I'm using this for example, but I sincerely do desire to do those things. And I believe that there are people out there who sincerely desire to live for the Lord inside you do, and you just seem to struggle. And after a while of struggling and saying it, you don't even want to raise your hand or say something about a scripture you read or about something you prayed to God because you think your family, who knows you the best, just won't believe anything you say. They won't believe your <coughs> desire in your heart. And after a while, that can keep you from wanting to have an encounter with God because you think it really won't matter. I'm telling you, that is just a lie of the enemy. Man, Zacchaeus was, was definitely not worthy. He wasn't a great guy. And you may feel like you're that same individual. Let me tell you something. God does have time for you. He does care about you. Can I tell you something? That Jesus is passing by this way today. And you need to cry out to Jesus to have mercy on your soul. You need to cry out to him. Nicodemus came in the dark. He did, but he came. Zacchaeus didn't care that it was crowded and that he couldn't see. He was going to find a way to get to Jesus regardless of what anyone else thought. And in both cases, Jesus received them and he had a desire to change their life. You cannot let obstacles get in the way of you getting before Jesus. Not your opinion of yourself, not how good or how bad you are. Sometimes it's how good you are. Sometimes you don't go down front because you think, I'm well, I'm wrong. You're missing the point. You really are. You cannot let busy schedules, you can't let the thoughts of others. Some people think it's a waste of time for you even to go to church. You can't let sickness get in the way. Let's go to another example. We're going to look at the paralytic man that had to be let down through the roof. We're going to look in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Watch my time. Okay. One day while Jesus was teaching some Pharisees and teachers of religious laws, excuse me, some Pharisees and teachers of religious laws were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all of Galilee and Judea as well as from J Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men, some, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up on the roof and they took off some tiles. And then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your heart? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and he said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Listen, no matter what it is that's in your way of, getting, of you getting before Jesus, you've got to move past it. You gotta move around it. You gotta, you gotta get past it. You gotta get you, you can't let that be. The place where Jesus was at, if y'all can even begin to picture it, the place that he is, he was at was full. It was overflowing. They were outside the windows, they were outside the door. And here comes these men and they're carrying their paralyzed friend on this mat. They can't get there. The place is just surrounded. It's just full. It's a real problem. And they knew that they had to get their friends. Their friend in front of Jesus no matter what. That the only hope he had was to get him before the Lord. See, it didn't matter that it was full. It didn't matter that there wasn't a way in. Aren't you thankful that you don't have that problem today? I want you to kind of picture this. The place is full. It's, it's, it's packed. This, out one of the doors squeezes Peter. So you got all this mob of people outside 
And, and Peter comes over here along this fence line, along this brick wall. He says, I got an announcement for you. He says, listen, Jesus wants to have an encounter with you today. And he has seven chairs. Now here's this mob of people. He has seven chairs. Whether you need a healing, you want to just give him thanks, or you just want to praise him, Jesus will meet you at one of these chairs for seven of you. Can you imagine the rush of people desiring to be one of the seven to get to those chairs to have their encounter with God? What would you do? You're there. Jesus is in the building. Okay, here. Jesus is out in the hallway. And we hear a knock on the door. I go to the door. I come back in and say, listen, Jesus is out here. I know it's phenomenal. He's in the physical flesh. And he's going to meet any of you who are in these seven chairs. Now, can you imagine that? Y'all would just sit there. I think the ungodliness of y'all would come out and <laughs> pushing people down and you would rush over there. And I just want you to imagine, man, if, 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 whenever that roof with tiles was being opened and Jesus looked and he saw the old men came and coming and he, he saw the men, their faith as they were lowering down their friends, how, how excited he was to see them so full of faith coming to have an encounter with Jesus. And, and it's the same way. Listen, when, when he's here and he's offered and he says, I'll meet you and you got the seven chairs and you got the opportunity. And he sees you <coughs> coming down in faith to have an encounter with Jesus. And what an exciting moment. See, we don't have a roof that we have to take off. You don't have crowds here today or even next Sunday that you're going to have to push through. I'm just thinking, man, if there was a roof guy that they had to take off to get to you when they could have just walked to these chairs, I'm thinking that roof's pretty safe. <laughs> you know? You just got to imagine this joy. You just got to see this faith. You, I, I, want you, I want you to get to this place of understanding that it isn't always about you having a need to go to God. It's you going to have an encounter with Jesus just to tell him how uh, much I don't have a problem today. I want to go down there and I want to spend time to set a time to tell God how much I love him and I praise him and I worship him. You're trying to make me feel no, I'm not trying to make you feel good. I'm trying to make you feel great. And it is just simply amazing. So we're talking about getting in front of God. Because listen, you got busy schedule, you got tiredness, you got friends' activities, you got things that get in your way of life. And I'm the same way as you. I have to sometimes make time and, and sometimes I go to bed and I think, man, I did not spend any time with God today the way that I wanted to. Oh, I thought about it. I mean, of course, once you're in bed, okay, I'm in bed. I'm going to get my tablet out. I'll read about you now. But it is an act. And I'm not saying don't do it because, listen, it's better to do it then than not do it at all. But I want God to be more front and center in that in my life and in your life. I, I, and so I just want you to picture that when you kneel at your couch or you kneel at your bed or you, you stop wherever you are on Sunday, you come down to it. I want you just to picture that you are coming to kneel at the feet of Jesus. And that he sees you coming in faith to have an encounter with him. That makes him happy. The last example today is out of Luke 7. And it is about a woman who is a sinful woman. And she's the woman who cried and she shed the tears. And she, she wiped the feet of Jesus. And she put the perfume on his feet. And she kissed his feet. And she anointed all this. She did all of this while Jesus was sitting at the table eating dinner with Simon the Pharisee. Simon did not ask Jesus to come to his house for dinner because he liked Jesus. He came there the same way all the Pharisees was, is he just wanted to trap Jesus. He wanted to get some evidence on Jesus. So let's look at this in Luke chapter 7, verse 36. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eaten there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, 
If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him the story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? <coughs> and Simon answered, I suppose the one from whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with the kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said, said, the men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, before we go into the scripture, I want to show you a video. It's a movie clip from this scene. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Simon, I have someone to say unto thee. Say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. <clears throat> thou hast rightly judged. Seest thou this wound? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. 
but she hath washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she not the much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same love of little. love that image. I know I can read the scriptures to you, but sometimes I think when you can just kind of see this grace and this mercy, because same thing here. When she came in, she wasn't welcome. She wasn't wanted to be there. Had she went to the feet of Simon, the Pharisee, and, and tried that same thing, he would have escorted her out. She wasn't welcome. But she was willing to take the risk to have the encounter to, to put away her own thoughts of all the sinfulness and those sins were men uh, the judgment of everybody that would as she walked down the street and went, went to enter to the room to the house she knew she wasn't good enough but she knew without Jesus she was nothing came to a place she wasn't welcome. She came humbly, knowing she was a sinner. But Jesus saw the guilt, he saw the shame, he saw the repentance, he saw the remorse, <coughs> he saw how she felt, he saw the love that she had for him. I mean, can you imagine if he was standing over there and she was in her midst and as she went to him, what his face would appear like how glad that he would be. Even if she fell last night and the week before and she came. That is exactly the image I want you to put in your mind when you go before the Lord. And, and maybe you've had a week where you've stumbled and you've fought with your wife or your husband and you've done things and said things and allowed emotions to get in the way and bad judgment to get in the way. But man, even though you've been human and stumbled and fallen, and listen, that moment that you say, I need God. I know I've done all these things wrong, but I need you, Jesus. And you begin to go before Him. It's just how He, in that, that image of Him gently looking down. That love, that compassion, that acceptance, that is how it is. And so my message today is you've got to get to Jesus. You've got to get to Jesus when things are terrible, rotten, and bad. And you've got to get to Jesus when things are awesome and amazing and you can't believe how good He has been to you. Your, your number one goal needs to be, yes, to come for help, two, to come to give praise, to share love, to, to, to just show Him that you love Him, your thankfulness, your gratefulness. Because there was two people in, that, in Simon's house. There was more than that. The two that were focusing on. There was the sinner. And there was Simon who thought he was good. And one of those persons left change. <coughs> and it was the one who needed Jesus the most. The one who recognized it the most. So the question is, are you willing to remove a roof? Are you willing to... Some, let, let me just tell you. Sometimes I think what people say is... I'm not ready to give my life over to the Lord. I don't think I can live right or 100% for Him, so I'm going to wait till I can. That's what I said for a long time. I was 23, but many times prior to that, 
I thought about giving my life to her, but I just thought, I mean, I'm not, I know I'm going to fall, I know I'm going to do my friends, I'm going to do the things I've been doing, and, and I just, I don't think I'm going to make it successfully, and so the enemy tricked me into just not even trying it. But I guarantee it, any one of those days, even though Jesus knew I was going to fail and fall and mess up the, the next day, he would have welcomed me, and the enemy kept me away, deceived me. So I want you just to, I want you just to bow your heads today. And listen, and promise, church, we don't look around. Because we love the person on the right, the left, and front, and back of us so much, we want to make them know you've got your privacy. <coughs> we want this time to be between you, God, and the pastor. And we're not going to mess with you. So the first thing I want to ask you, if you're here today, be honest. No one is going to see this. It's just me, you, and God. And if you know that your life is not right, that God is not first and foremost, that He's He's not the Savior of your soul right now. Oh, you you've thought about it, and perhaps you you attempted in the past, but you know right now that if you were to die and stand before Jesus, that you're not sure He would even let you into His into His kingdom. If that's you today, and one you can confess it, that you that is who you are. Number two, you can say, you know what, Pastor, I don't want to be that way. I want my sins forgiven. I don't know I'll be perfect in the future, but I know right now, at this moment, my heart's desire is to have Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. If that's you, then I want you just to raise your hand and put it back down. Good. All over. Okay, let's, we're going to pray with you first. So you can just repeat this prayer. You can... Listen, no, you know what? Don't even be a, I mean, you can pray it out loud. I'm not saying you got to scream it out loud, but you can whisper it, whatever. Don't, do not be embarrassed to sit there and say, you know what? Today, I, I'm recommitting my life or I'm committing it for the first time. There's nothing to be embarrassed about it now. So just say, dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've made mistakes. I feel like I have failed you. But I ask you right now, to forgive me of my sins. To be the Lord of my life. Let me, let me have this encounter with you right now. And Father, help me to repent. To turn from my ways. And to live a pleasing life for you. I surrender it all. 